Okay, um, welcome to uh, the lecture of day three. Uh, so this morning I will be telling you about uh, networks and use of networks for um, interpreting, helping to interpret uh, or visually interpret data, including the results of the pathway enrichment test that you guys did, uh, the pathway enrichment analysis. So um, Lincoln, or yesterday's uh, uh, slides in the afternoon, or yesterday's slides about Reactome, talked about pathways and, and, and a little bit on networks. Um, the network part was mostly to introduce the networks that were in use with Reactome FI. Um, where you download networks. So I'm going to cover networks as well. Um, there'll be a little bit of overlap, but my the, cover, um, the concepts that I'm going to be talking about are more focused on network visualization and how to interpret the, you know, how these networks are visualized. I'll mention a little bit of network analysis that wasn't covered yesterday, um, so hopefully there's not too much overlap. Um, okay, so the, um, and, uh, and I'll also be talking about Cytoscape in general today. So um, a typical network analysis workflow includes um, first getting some network information from somewhere. So you, you uh, got network information yesterday from Reactome FI. For instance, you can load in your list of genes or mutations and, and pull down a network. That's one type of network information. There's lots of sources for, for this network information. And then you, um, the second thing you do is load some information about the networks. The, the, uh, genes and, and interactions um, have information associated with them. And uh, that could be expression data or mutation data. Um, and then you and analyze and visualize networks. So I, I'll be talking mostly about the visualization thing this morning and, and some analysis. Uh, and then a lot of people, uh, w you know, ideally, once you've finished your network analysis and you have a nice network figure that shows something interesting, like here's the genes that are more often mutated in my sample that, I've, that I'm studying um, and, and how they're, they're connected into modules, for instance, then you can ideally create an image for publication. And um, the, uh, you know, it's easy enough to save the image from the tool that you're working with, and especially Cytoscape. You can save it as a PDF or, or uh, take a screenshot. Um, and, um, and, but, but actually, there's a little bit more than you can do to make uh, even better publication quality images. So this, uh, this workflow was covered in a paper from a number of years ago now in Nature Protocols that we wrote to uh, discuss how biological networks and gene expression data can be integrated and analyzed. Okay, so I'm going to talk, um, give you a quick introduction about networks again, um, covering hopefully covering some different topics that were covered yesterday, um, f focus on network visualization, and discuss Cytoscape uh, as a software tool. Everybody's tried it already, but I'm going to just go over it again and see if anybody has questions um, from a more general point of view. And, um, uh, and then I'll, I'll mention network analysis, just a little bit broader than what was mentioned yesterday. So, um, so networks, uh, sort of the, the, the main goal of network information or networks, why we bother to, you know, why we care about networks is that they're, um, they're very good at representing relationships in data. So um, in biology, people are very interested in different types of relationships, physical interactions between genes, regulatory networks like Wyeth discussed, uh, genetic interaction networks. We haven't discussed those so much here, but if you're working with certain model organisms, uh, synthetic lethal interactions are very important, and also more and more in cancer. Uh, functional interactions are, are interactions between genes where um, it might not be a specific experiment, that define the, the interaction, but the, inter the, the, uh, the relationship means that the genes are somehow functionally related. So um, it could be that genes are co-expressed, or it could be that they're, it's kind of a more general, general concept. It could be that genes are co-expressed, that they're physically interacting. Uh, it could mean that the uh, genes have similar sequence. Um, so functional interactions are, are fairly general. Um, and as I mentioned, they're, they're useful for discovering relationships, interesting relationships in large data sets. So it's much better than looking at all the information in a table or a spreadsheet. Um, so imagine if you had um, a bunch of interactions between genes and you loaded them into a spreadsheet, you'd have to have, say, two columns. Uh, column one is you know, gene A, column two is gene B, and e those two columns create relationships. So gene A is connected to gene B 
and then you have a r one row for every interaction. So it would be difficult to see the structure of the network if you didn't load it into a network uh, visualization system. Um, another useful, uh, another way that networks are useful is that it's, uh, it's, they're very good for visualizing multiple different data to types together. So you could look at protein interactions and gene expression and mutations and methylation and a whole bunch of other things that you layer onto the network and visualize. And then finally, uh, over the past decade or so, um, or almost 15 years, uh, a lot of people have developed very some very interesting network analysis algorithms. Uh, um, you, met, uh, you looked at Reactom FI yesterday. Okay, so here's an example of uh, a network that um, I think many of you probably read the, um, the Nature Biotech um, uh, paper that we sent out before um, about how to interpret, visually interpret network, biological networks. Um, and so some of the figures from here are, are derived from that, uh, taken from that paper. But just to, um, uh, you know, show this uh, quickly, briefly, um, this network is a network of protein interactions uh, between yeast proteins and the, uh, a number of different types of information is layered on this network. So um, gene function uh, is some information about gene function is layered on this network. So we have uh, replication fork genes are covered in, are colored red, nucleosome genes are covered uh, green, and uh, the width of the lines connecting the, the genes is proportional to some uh, gene expression correlation from a gene expression data set that measured genes across the cell cycle. So uh, genes at different points of the gene expression at different points of the cell cycle. So um, genes that are that have a thick connection, thick uh, edge or line between them are highly correlated across the cell cycle experiment. And then the size of the circle is proportional to how high the transcription is at any given stage, the maximum transcription level at any given stage of the cell cycle. So some of these genes are highly expressed and some of them aren't that highly expressed. And, um, um, and then, you know, once this was visualized, there was a few, there were a few modifications made to this figure um, in another, uh, so this figure was generated in Cytoscape and then uh, the, a PDF was saved and then loaded into Adobe Illustrator or you could use any kind of uh, editing, image editing software to, and then we, we added these labels here um, and we circled certain things that we want to emphasize. We added an arrow here um, and so this, this uh, extra uh, work that was done in another, in a sort of image editing program just helps emphasize certain regions that, that are not easy to graphically display in, in, a, in a tool like Cytoscape. Um, and so um, I'll mention this a little bit more later, but this is just a quick, quick example. So you can see that there's, um, uh, you know, some structure in this network. There's uh, kinetochore genes are, are more uh, connected to each other than you would expect. All these functions act like that. Uh, and you can sort of see general um, distances between things. So certain sections of this network are closer than others, um, and uh, um, it's it's uh, somewhat instructive. Okay, so Lincoln also mentioned pathways yesterday. So um, pathways and pathways are and networks are somehow related um, in that pathways have network type relationships. They have connections between proteins or genes or molecules, small molecules in the case of metabolism. Um, so this is an example of metabolic pathway and a gene regulatory pathway and a, and a uh, sorry, a signaling pathway and a gene regulatory pathway. And this is just a network of protein interactions, thousands of them um, from a mass spectrometry experiment. Um, so uh, pathways usually have more detail on the connections. Um, that's the, the major difference. Also, pathways, sometimes uh, networks are really limited to pairwise connections between genes currently, uh, and pathways can have more than two things in, involved in a relationship. So that's one, one difference. So sometimes they're, they might be difficult to um, visualize in, in Cytoscape because of that, or in, as a network. Okay, so uh, I mentioned uh, network analysis, um, you know, what, you know, that people are interested in using network 
net networks or the concept of networks because there are all these analysis algorithms out there. So um, just as a, a very, and, and you already covered some, but just as a very simple example of where, of how these network analyses uh, are uh, often derived, um, is that uh, people have actually studied networks for a very long time, more than 100 years in math and computer science. And, and before computer science, people studied in math. And um, in that field, it's uh, called graph theory, and a network is called a graph. We don't use that term in biology because most people, when you ask what a graph is, they think of a plot. Um, so network is more intuitive as a word for, for uh, most people. And um, the interesting thing about this area of graph theory is that there are a huge amount of algorithms that are available where people have uh, used, developed some algorithm to answer some question about these networks. So just as an example, um, how many people have heard of the six degrees of separation? Okay, almost everybody. So this is the idea that uh, everybody in the world is connected to everyone else through acquaintance or friendships by at most six links, or on average six links. And this, this was an interesting concept that was uh, discovered in the 60s. Um, I, uh, Stanley Milgram, who's a famous um, social psychologist, I guess, uh, had, was interested in uh, finding out how people are connected. And so he uh, sent a bunch of postcards to people in Boston, and he said, um, I want you to send this postcard to somebody in New York, and the person they gave the person's name and um, what they did. Um, and But you have to send it through friends. You can't mail it to the guy, and I'm not giving you his address. So, um, so people tried to forward the postcard to a friend who they thought was somehow closest to a banker in New York. And, um, and surprisingly, most, many of the postcards actually made it to the, to the guy um, without going through the postal service, without going, uh, you know, through the, uh, using the, the person's address. And uh, each step along the way, he also asked that people send a postcard back to him so he could trace where they were going. And, um, and he found that, on average, it took six, six jumps to get to this person. Um, for the ones that, that made it through. So that was an interesting experiment um, that was kind of fun. Um, and um, I'm sure it's much smaller than six degrees now with, with Facebook. But um, the, uh, the question that he was asking is, you know, that was a time-consuming experiment, um, but it, it, was, it, did its, it, it served its purpose to map social relationships. But the question that he was asking is, how are people connected in Boston to New York? Uh, and what path, how, you know, how, what path can you t follow to get from one person to another? So if you know the full network, um, there's a computer science algorithm called breadth first search that is guaranteed to find a connection if it exists, and if it, if it finds a connection, it's guaranteed that it's the shortest connection, or one of the shortest connections. Uh, there could be lots of different possible routes that are all equally short. Um, so people have in this field, in the scrap field of graph theory, have mathematically proven that this algorithm will work. If it finds, if, it, if a path is there, it will find it, guaranteed, if, uh, and, and it will be the shortest path, guaranteed. Um, so, um, you know, this is a very standard algorithm in graph theory, and uh, you can uh, see if this type of algorithm is useful for answering questions in, in biology. So, for instance, if you had a protein interaction network and you're interested to see it, how two proteins were connected, you could just run this algorithm and it would tell you, okay, these two proteins are connected or they're not connected, and if they're connected, this is the path that you can follow. Um, so, uh, so that's an example of people taking uh, in interesting algorithms from computer science and, and applying them to biology, finding a, a, or asking a biological question and then going to computer science and asking you know, is there an algorithm already that can help me answer this question? Um, another example that you saw yesterday is graph clustering that Lincoln, or uh, that was that was mentioned, where um, you find these connected modules. So that's those are algor the, the algorithms that find those modules are standard algorithms in computer science. There's thousands of them actually, um, and uh, people uh, we can just use them and we know that they're going to work. So um, one question to always ask. Uh, so, well, so a lot of the network analysis methods that, that people use have some basis in computer science and, um, and, and usually there's some history behind the algorithms and people have taken those algorithms and applied them to biology, which is very powerful because um, we don't have to invent something new, we just 
take something that's already working and, and apply it. Um, the question that you always need to ask is whenever you are looking at some new type of network analysis that you come across is ask yourself how biologically relevant it is. So for instance, the shortest path question, um, okay, I can find a path between two proteins in a protein interaction network, but is that an actual signal transduction path? Maybe not. Maybe it doesn't consider context. Maybe it doesn't consider a lot of things that you would need to consider to know that that path was somehow useful in a cell. Um, okay, so many applications of network biology have been um, have been uh, or many applications in network biology have been developed, and this next slide and the next one just lists a, a bunch of different ones. So um, we'll be talking about gene function prediction this afternoon. Um, detection of modular structure is what you we you talked about yesterday with uh, one of this, the parts of, of Reactome FI. People have used uh, these algorithms to study network evolution. So if you have networks from different species, there are algorithms to align networks. Um, you can, it's similar to sequence alignment. And uh, people also have uh, used different methods to predict new interactions. So predicting protein interactions, predicting functional interactions, um, all sorts of different interactions can be predicted based on existing data. So sometimes you'll come across networks that have a lot of predictive, predicted information. Um, there's also a lot of re especially recent interest in uh, cr developing algorithms for uh, methods to help study disease. So uh, I think Lincoln, or it was mentioned yesterday, uh, the um, people can study, can find, there's, there's methods to find subnetworks or little pieces of networks that are correlated with, di with disease somehow. Um, um, so those are, people call them network biomarkers. Um, and there are also um, uh, ways of uh, um, doing genome, genome-wide association studies with, with networks. Um, which we can talk about. So I'm not going to go through these in, very, in, in a lot of detail, but each one of these has a, um, uh, a Cytoscape plugin available, actually, that uh, you can go in and uh, check out. Um, and I'll, we'll talk more about that a lot uh, more, more later. Okay, so I mentioned that it's always important to consider how biologically relevant this, this, uh, these networks are. So networks are a model of how we think the cell is working. They only capture a certain type of information, relationships between often genes. And the, um, and it, I think it was, it was mentioned yesterday, how you can, you can have different uh, network um, mappings. And I'll just mention that. Um, it would, uh, briefly, to remind you that um, uh, you, you can, the, the nodes and edges can represent different things, um, but often what's missing, um, almost always, is uh, information about dynamics. Um, what, uh, often networks are representing some static image, so it's not showing you how things are changing over time. Um, there are actually a lot of ways of representing this information using more detailed mathematical rep uh, models. Uh, we're not covering it in this course, um, but people, there's quite a lot of software and tools out there and resources for doing mathematical simulations of pathways and biological systems. Uh, typically, these are not very applicable to genomics data. The reason is, is that they don't cover a lot of genes. So usually, mathematical models of a particular system are very focused and only include a specific system of interest. And so when you're, when you have gene, you know, your genomics experiment and you want to um, do some math mathematical modeling, you have a big problem because only a tiny fraction of the genes that you've found are interesting in your experiment have any information at this level of detail. So that's why we're not really con considering that here. Um, there's a lot of detail missing often. Um, for instance, we represent often proteins as these nodes, which are often visualized as circles. Um, well, proteins have a lot more structure. They're, they have domains and, and 3D structure. Often that, that structure is known somehow. Um, and the context is often missing. So this is related to dynamics, but it's sort of which parts of the network are active at which times, or under, in which tissues, or which cells, uh, which developmental stages. So um, it's always good to just note that that kind of stuff is not usually represented in a, in a network diagram. OK, so just to summarize, networks are, are primarily useful for, for helping you 
identify relationships in large data that are otherwise could be hidden. Um, it's, it's very important to understand um, how the network, as, as was mentioned yesterday, how the network is uh, structured. Um, and if you define your, um, uh, so, so one of the issues that, um, so I, one of the things that I, uh, in, in the slides that I showed you with all the different analysis methods, one of the issues with all these analysis methods is that sometimes it's difficult to find the analysis method that's useful for your question. Um, so in this course, we've tried to select a few that are generally useful, but there are many dozens of other ones. Uh, and the, um, uh, so there, there are lots of methods available for, for net network analysis of gene lists. Um, it's important to define your biological question, so what you want to do, and then you can try and find a method that is going, is available already to answer your question. Um, so that's probably the, the best way. Um, the other way of doing it, which is more difficult, is you can become an expert in lots of different methods and you'll just know how they can be applied to your data. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're ever stuck uh, and you have a, you know, a question, obviously we can address it in this class, but uh, you can always email uh, a mailing list, like the Cytoscape mailing list, and say, I'm, you know, I have this data, uh, I'm interested in seeing how, um, you know, in answering this question, is there any network analysis tool that's available that helps me answer this question? Okay, so uh, I'm going to switch topics to network visualization and um, just go over a few different concepts here that are, that are important to understand. They're pretty basic concepts, but just to review, just to go over them um, in a little bit more detail is useful. So, uh, so there's, there's different ways of representing a network. So um, this is the, the common way of representing a network um, where we have nodes and edges and they, the connections are visualized nicely. Um, but you may also see other types of network representations that are equivalent. Um, they just visualize differently. So um, the, the basic way of representing a network as a table is what I explained earlier. So if you just have a list of relationships and you load them into a spreadsheet, um, you can visualize them as this table like this. You might have some additional information associated with these, these connections, like the strength of the connection or what experiment was used to derive that connection. Um, so this is a, a, a list of relationships. Um, and then sometimes people also, um, especially in, uh, actually it's been quite popular with yeast genetic interactions, people often visualize their, their interaction network as a, as a uh, a matrix or a, uh, and then color the squares um, based on, for instance, the strength of the interaction. So this is then a, a heat map. So a, um, uh, in this, rep this the, all these representations are, are equivalent. This blue uh, interaction here is shown here. It's between A3 and A5, um, A3 and A5. And then this blue one is here and it's also here because this is a bit symmetric. Um, for relationships that are symmetric. Uh, you have A3 connected to A5 and A3 to connected to A5. So this, this matrix basically has all the, the nodes or proteins or genes on one side and the same set of proteins and genes on the other side. And then you color the square wherever there's an interaction. And um, usually heat maps uh, also apply some clustering to the rows and columns to organize rows based on, uh, to organize put similar rows together and similar columns together. Um, so you probably you may have seen that before. Uh, and the major difference between these, why one would be more useful than the other, uh, does anyone know why one would be more useful than the other? It might be easier to see, I was gonna say it might be easier to see modules in the heat map than the It may be. Um, any other <coughs> ideas? So that usually the main reason why, uh, vis from a visualization point of view, why one is, might be better than the other is, is how sparse the, the data is. So if you only have a few connections, it doesn't really make sense to draw the whole heat map because most of this information is blank. Um, so in the network, you only draw what you have. And so, um, however, if you had everything connected to everything else, the network would be not very useful because you wouldn't be able to see all the connections could be all they'd all be overlapping. Um, people t um, people uh, typically call that a hairball, um, which you've probably heard. So the heat map is actually really good for that. So that's 
the main reason from a visualization point of view. So from a visualization point of view, you are really concerned with how well the, the visualization tool is communicating information and how good it's using space on this, on this screen, etc. Okay, so, um, so network, network uh, visualization is actually um, fairly straightforward these days, but it's dependent on a very important concept, which is uh, automatic network layout. So everyone who used Cytoscape, I think you, you tried the, the automatic network layout. You might not have um, thought too much. It's just, you know, it's just something that you do by default. Um, but uh, this is actually a very important part of, of visualization. If we didn't have it, then we all of our networks would look like this. So this is um, you know a network that you would just draw uh, if you were just loading up nodes and or say these nodes are genes and connecting them all. Um, automatic network visualization gives us a nice pretty picture. In general, these um, now the, and then lots of different network layout algorithms have been developed again from computer science and we're just we're just copying them over to biology and using them. So one of the most common types of network layout algorithms is called the force directed. Sometimes it's called a spring embedded uh, network or, or layout algorithm. And um, it tries to, uh, in, in general, most network layout algorithms are developed to try to optimize the layout in a couple of ways. One, it tries to move nodes away from each other so they're not overlapping. And it tries, to, and the second thing that it tries, they generally try to do is reduce crossings of edges. So if you have connections uh, between genes that cross each other, the more times you have a crossing, the more complicated the network looks, and it's difficult to trace the connections because um, often, if there's lots of crossings, you won't actually know, be able to kind of see how things are um, connected. So you want to reduce the crossings. The ultimate reduction is that you have no crossings. That's not easy to achieve. Um, in fact, it's impossible for a lot of networks. Um, but the um, but that's the goal of, of most network layout algorithms. So these force-directed layout algorithms, the way they achieve this is um, they use a, a physics-based idea where the nodes are represented as uh, like you know positive charges that repel each other. Um, and the edges are somehow pulling each other. So maybe they're represented as gravitational forces where, you know, they, they, the nodes want to come together, but the nodes are chart like, you know, like charges, so they're kind of pushing each other apart. Sometimes the edges are thought of, of springs. So they have, um, uh, you may remember from high school physics, people have a, you have a spring constant and a, and a, 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 a resting length of the spring, and the spring can kind of bounce and compress and, and bounce. So the um, the so those concepts are used and the uh, in the by these algorithms and the algorithms simulate a system like this and you can think of it as kind of taking a network that is has nodes and and uh, edges that that are kind of springy and you throw it up in the air and it's jumbling around and then when it you know lands it kind of rests comes to rest and um, it's figured out that you know nodes are all the forces are, are, are figured out so that the nodes are far away from each other and the edges are um, pulling things together such that nodes that are actually highly connected are more likely to be close to each other. Um, so this is um, a sort of generally how they, these force-directed algorithms work. Um, they're excellent in general, uh, but they, they're, they're, uh, they're not great for very large networks. So um, I'd say on average, if you have up to 500 nodes, maybe if you have a nice big monitor and a good computer, you can um, you can visualize bigger networks. But the more nodes that you have, and also the more edges that you have in your network, the harder it's going to be for these network layout algorithms to find a good solution. So um, so bigger networks uh, tend to give hairballs, um, and the only way to reduce that is to remove some nodes or some edges. Um, so General advice whenever you're trying out the network layout is to use a force-directed layout algorithm first. If you have, um, but it's not the only type of network alg uh, layout algorithm that exists. There are others that are specialized for certain types of networks. So if you have a network that is more like a tree, um, for instance, it's a pedigree or it's a, a protein phylogenetic, uh, protein sequence phylogenetic tree or the gene ontology hierarchy, uh, there are hierarchical layout algorithms which kind of create the you know tr lay the tree lay trees out very nicely, 
Um, and, uh, and there's other types of network layout algorithms as well. So um, general advice is to try force directed first and uh, also try different layout algorithms and see which ones work best. Don't always, you don't always have to rely on, on one. Um, and what works best is what's visually clear to you in, in a couple of ways that I'll tell you about later. Um, okay, so tips for better looking networks. So if you're ever going to, I briefly mentioned this earlier, if you're ever going to uh, publish a network figure that you make, then you really should adjust the layout manually. So these network, uh, automatic uh, network layout algorithms work quite well, but generally they don't do as good a job as you can do if you're moving things around yourself. So they, they give you, you know, a lot of help but then if you're for publication quality images, you usually can move things around. So one of the things that often happens when you do this, these layouts is that, for instance, you might have uh, node la uh, labels like gene names on your, on your network. And uh, some gene names are longer than others. The network layout algorithms typically don't consider the label. So the labels might be overlapping each other. And so you might want to move the nodes around so that you can reduce that, that overlap. Um, whenever you have any kind of overlap, you want to kind of reduce it. Uh, and um, another uh, useful tip is to load the uh, network into a drawing program like Illustrator, uh, move the labels around. You, you might want to emphasize certain things, color, color things differently, as I mentioned. Okay, so um, one of the, the big problems that people face with networks when they're, especially when they're really big, as I've mentioned a couple of times, is that they get a hairball. Um, affectionately called, sometimes people call these things other, you know, something else. Um, somebody called this once the Death Star. Um, but uh, the, you know, this is, this is a, a really big network. I think there's over 3,000 proteins in this network. Uh, sorry, I think there's over 3,000 connections in this network with hundred, hundreds, almost a thousand proteins. And the, um, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to see what's going on. So you definitely see certain things, like there's a big connection here, that there's a big section here that's highly connected. This section isn't as highly connected. Here's another sort of module maybe. Um, but in general, it's kind of hard to see. So uh, if you are faced with something like this, you really need to zoom into something uh, or filter it in some way to get a better picture. So often you can, um, there's a couple of ways of doing this. So in this case, I took a few proteins from this network and I zoomed in just to see the connections among those proteins. So this is, these are proteins involved in, in cell wall integrity and in yeast. So if you have particular processes or sets of, your, your gene list for instance uh, defines a set of genes that might be interesting and maybe you, your gene list is really big so you have, you might have a way of focusing your gene list uh, to a smaller list of genes. And you can just look at that list to see how it's um, the connections among the genes in that list to see how they're, they're organized. Um, another way is to reduce the number of, of connections. Sometimes the connections have uh, confidence associated with them and you can remove uh, connections that are less confident and focus on the strongest signal and then you'll relay out the network, you'll see some structure and you can keep on doing that uh, until you, you see some structure. Okay, it's a little, it's it's an interactive process that really requires often a lot of tuning. Um, it's not often that you can just press a button and get a nice uh, network unless your your networks are are small. Okay, I mentioned uh, as well um, that you can layer on a lot of different types of information on your network. Uh, often this is done visually using different types of visual features. So you can imagine that you have all sorts of different ways of representing nodes and edges. So we have different shapes for nodes. We can have different types of connection lines that connect to show connections. We can have different types of arrows. So here you might want to say this is an inhibiting arrow. This is an activating arrow. Uh, and um, there's color, size, shape. Uh, and you know in this in this network. Uh, that we've seen before, um, we've used a bunch of these things. We've used color, size, uh, the width of the edges are um, proportional to some data. So there's, there are um, a few different types of data here. One, uh, transcriptional amplitude for size. This is a second type of data that we had. Uh, the color is a third type of data we had. And then the, the actual data that kind of creates the structure of this network is protein interaction data. So there are four types of data overlaid kind of combined in this network. And it's, um, it's really up to your imagination how you want to visualize your 
net your data. Um, you can choose to visualize uh, data in any way. I mean, there's certain natural, uh, there's certain natural um, ways to visualize certain types of data. Like, for instance, if you have gene expression data that's on a continuous scale, you might want to visualize that as a color gradient. But you could also visualize it as a size gradient, so bigger nodes are more differentially expressed. Um, it, it's really up to you. Okay, so as I mentioned briefly before, um, uh, visual, interpreting these types of networks, there's sort of four major uh, ways that uh, people, four major concepts that are important for that to look at, look for in networks when you have a network. So one is the relationships between these different types of data. So here um, we can see that there's a highly connected region that's all green and the nodes are all big and they're all highly, they're, the edges are all really thick uh, connections. So this means that the nucleosome, we know that this is a nucleosome, it is um, highly expressed in the cell, across some stage of the cell cycle. All the, the genes seem to be co-expressed, so they're following, they're keeping track, they're tracking each other. And, um, and they're all, they all have protein interactions. So we can quite easily see that pattern by looking at this network. It would be much more difficult to see that if all that data was present in, in tables. Um, so those, those are relationships between data. Another uh, central idea is uh, guilt by association, which is, uh, we'll talk a lot more about this afternoon with gene function prediction. But early on, people recognized that if you have a um, gene that's connected to another gene, most likely, or they're, they're, those genes have an increased chance of being functionally related somehow, maybe part of the same pathway or same complex. And you can see that here, that blue genes are kind of hanging out together. Um, usually, there's, there's, it's not always the case, like here's a, a gene that's blue that's not hanging out with these guys, and actually, when I looked this up, it's being misannotated somehow, so it wasn't um, uh, correct, somehow it wasn't correct in, in, in the data that we downloaded for, to make this figure. Um, so you might see some examples, here's another one, like that. Um, the, uh, you, you also find these dense clusters, so that's one type of thing to look for in networks, and dense clusters in protein interaction networks represent, often represent complexes or pathways, um, and uh, in other types of networks they may, they may represent other things. So the modules that were found in Reactome FI are often represent pathways. Uh, and then there's global relationships between sections of the network. So um, nucleosome is more connected to kinetochore. So these four things, uh, concepts, are uh, useful to uh, interpret networks. And they're also things that uh, sort of um, aspects of networks that you should look for. And when you're laying out your network or visualizing your network, if you can visualize them in your network in a way that makes these things more apparent, then that's useful. So the ne automatic network layout algorithms, like the force-directed networks, what they do often is they pull genes or nodes together if they're highly connected, like these guys are pulled together because they're highly connected. You can imagine if all of these things were kind of have springs that were pulling each other together, they would end up like this in the, in the algorithm. So, um, so that the, the force-directed layout algorithms are very good for helping people to, to see dense clusters. Um, if you didn't have that, you would, they would, you know, the, these nodes would be spread out everywhere. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so when you are choosing different ways of visualizing your networks, you can think about these, type, these concepts and see if the way that you, the choice that you've made for visualization is making, making these more obvious. Um, any questions? Okay, so that is pretty straightforward, I think, but um, I think important to, to cover. Uh, so just to summarize, we, we need automatic layout to visualize networks. It's very important. Uh, there are lots of different network layout algorithms, so we can try, you, you can always uh, try different ones to see which ones give a better result for your network. Uh, networks help visualize interesting relationships in large data. Uh, you can avoid complicated networks by focusing your analysis, and um, visual attributes can help you overlay different types of data together and see how they're uh, related. Okay, so... Um, Yes? Yes. Um, are we going to, we'll be going over how to assign like values and things to the genes. Like to, in order to get, like the, the image you were showing, you're showing a complicated network, right? With all the different values, you know, the thickness of 
the edges and like, yeah. Will we cover all that? Um, so I'll, I'll show you that in Cytoscape. Um, the challenge there is that there's lots of different types of data that, that you could load up. And, uh, and each person has often their own types of data. So um, there are general ways of loading that data up into Cytoscape, and then you can, you can visualize it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. OK, the only, the only issue is getting the data. So sometimes some data is easily accessible, and some data you might have to collect from different places and put together. Yeah, sure. I guess I was j just generally, is, are those basic features of Cytoscape or are those plugins that help you? The visualization is a basic feature of Cytoscape. Um, but and pulling in the data as well, but um, loading in the data from kind of generic tables is what's yeah. part of Cytoscape uh, yeah. initially by, by default. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch to discussing Cytoscape. So Cytoscape, as, as you know, because I think uh, probably everybody's tried it out by now, um, as we assigned that before the course, um, is a free software for network visualization and analysis. The, um, it's, it's, it was originally developed at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle in 2001. And since then, it became an open source project, which meant that um, it, they gave away all of their the source code that was used to develop the application and lots of additional groups joined to, uh, to uh, help develop the, the software. And my group in Toronto is one of the around 10 groups around the world that um, is, is working on this. Uh, Trey Eideker uh, is at, in San Diego and Ben in, uh in the Pasteur Institute were originally at the Institute for Systems Biology, so they were the originators of this project and lots of other people have joined in. The idea is that um, as, you, as you guys probably know, uh, most of the labs that are involved in tool development aren't really often interested in being tool developers. They're interested in scientific questions, but they have to have some tools, of, uh, they have to develop some tools to help them answer their questions. So if there's a, a number of labs that are interested in the same questions, they can share the workload by um, sharing the development of the tools and spend each person spends less time developing tools and more time on their, their science, but they're sharing all the, the tool development. So, um, so through that effort, uh, Cytoscape has grown to be a soft software that um, is, is quite useful and fairly standard for network analysis and visualization. Uh, there, is, um, there are lots of extensions or plugins. Or now they're, they're in Cytoscape 3, which we're not including in this course right now. They're called apps, and I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you more about that. Um, and the idea with Cytoscape, as I've already mentioned with networks in general, is that you somehow um, you load up information to Cytoscape, uh, you load up network information and also experimental data, uh, and then you visualize it and, and analyze it and, and uh, use it to answer some question that you're, you're thinking about. So Cytoscape, by default, ha helps you manipulate networks. So you can uh, select a set of nodes and, and uh, copy that to a new network. Uh, you can filter and query um, uh, nodes and edges. Uh, it has lots of features for automatic layout. And it has some features uh, for pulling in data from standard repositories, like searching interaction databases to get network information. But one of the, one of the most powerful parts of Cytoscape, the reason why it's, it's, it's popular is, um, other than the fact that it's free, is that there are um, there's a, a large community of developers uh, and people using Cytoscape. So um, it has uh, 5,000 downloads per month, and there's tens of thousands of users. So um, all these users have helped develop tutorials and case studies and publications. So there are lots of examples of how to use a lot of the tools in Cytoscape. There's a good mailing list for discussion. Uh, questions are answered on that mailing list. Um, they're pretty much guaranteed to be answered within a week. Um, and the, um, often they're, they're answered faster. Uh, there's a lot of data and documentation. Um, and now there are over 160 plugins that extend the functionality of Cytoscape. Um, these are all hosted now at the App Store, uh, apps.cytoscape.org. Um, if there, it, it, it's, it's, this is very useful if there's a plugin that does something that you want. Um, it's it's um, maybe, uh, not useful if you can't find a plugin. Um, so if there is no plugin that does what you want, then you can always build your own. 
Um, that requires a lot of knowledge right now in Java programming, so you either have that knowledge yourself or you have a friend who has that knowledge or you hire someone, uh, a, a software developer. Um, and uh, in the future, this will probably be uh, easier um, by uh, future versions of Cytoscape will support programming apps in different languages like Perl or Python or other things like that, so it might be, might be easier, so you'll be able to script things. Um, here's just a a uh, fun picture from the Cytoscape retreat uh, a few years ago in Toronto where people spelled out Cytoscape. Um, so, um, and the, the, next, uh, the next conference is in Paris in, in October for people that are really interested. Um, okay, so Cytoscape is a um, useful free software tool for network visualization and analysis. It provides basic network manipulation and visualization features by out of the box, and then you have to download plugins usually to extend the functionality, especially for analysis. So, okay, so um, I've loaded up Cytoscape 2.8 here, and um, I'm going to load up a uh, couple of files. So, um, by default, Cytoscape works with Cytoscape session files. Um, Cytoscape session files are a file format that Cytoscape uses to store all the information in a session. That information can incorporate, can include lots of different networks that you've loaded up, uh, attributes on the nodes and edges, uh, all your settings for how you want things visualized, um, and, and all that gets saved into one file. Uh, you can only load up one session at a time. If you try and load up another session, each session is kind of like a project. You have everything uh, set up for yourself for that project. If you want to load up another session, it will say, uh, you can only load up one session and it will switch from one, one session to another. Um, the uh, session files are .cys and um, it's actually a zip file so if anyone's interested in looking inside you just rename it to .zip and you can unzip it and it's, there's a bunch of files in there um, that you can look at if you're interested. Um, the uh, common issue that, that people uh, just um, one thing that's not intuitive with Cytoscape initially is that you're wondering how you can create your session file, how do you get data into the system. So you don't use this open to get data in. This is only to get data in once you've created a session file. However, to create a session file, you have to kind of go one step back, which is importing data. Um, and so this is actually the, um, the first thing that you usually want to do when you uh, run Cytoscape is um, you want to import data from various places. So um, you can import data from uh, um, the, the easiest place to import data is from a spreadsheet. Um, this is sort of the standard way that most people would import data. Um, they, there's, um, there's also ways of importing data from, from different web services and, and files from, from different places. So different, different format of uh, files. So the important thing with Cytoscape is that there's two major types of important thing to understand with importing data is that there are two major types of data to import. One is the network and one is the attributes. So the network is the connections between genes of interest and the um, attributes are attributes of the, the, the genes like we covered on a couple of days ago. Um, could be gene expression, could be gene function like gene ontology terms, uh, any type of information uh, could be associated with nodes or, or edges. So, um, and it's, it's actually uh, one of the, the big questions from people is, um, okay, I have all my gene expression data, but how do I get a network? How do I get network information? Where do I get the network from? So Reactum FI is one place that you can give, get networks uh, from that you looked at yesterday. Another place is Gene Mania that we'll talk about this afternoon. So Gene Mania um, has hundreds of different networks and you can there's a, there's, a, there's a Cytoscape plugin that allows you to load them all in. So I'm going to um, just start with a network type of uh, network information that we already have. Um, and I'm going to select it from the set of sample files that come with Cytoscape. So if you go to the Cytoscape directory, there is a sample data directory which you probably have seen that has a lot of different sample data and mine's a little bit messy so I always forget which um, let's see if this is the right one
So, um, so I've loaded up a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, that um, uh, has information in here that is previewed here. So there's different columns. Um, these two columns represent the protein interactions in this case that I have. So I'm going to select those to import. And, um, and then there's a type of, of um, interaction here. Um, so I happen to know that there's a type of interaction here. Um, these, this type can be anything you want. Um, any of the information associated with these interactions can be anything that you want, any kind of random, random information. Um, and, um, well, sorry, arbitrary information um, that you choose to load up. Um, in this case, these connections are either protein-protein, and sometimes it says PD, which is protein DNA. So I'm going to load that up. And um, I'm going to load up this column, which has a bunch of numbers associated with it. Uh, I have to select um, how the interactions are defined in this, in this file, so which columns contain uh, the source and the target. So column one is the, um, the source. I'll just say is the source. Column, three, column two is the, the target. And column three is the interaction type. Um, so these are colored here now. Um, and then this is just additional additional information here. Um, one thing that's uh, just a couple of tips with importing data is uh, you can click on the heading of this column here. Sorry, you can right click on this column and you can give a name to this column. Uh, if you have, uh, and, and you might need to choose the type of data, so whether it's an integer or a, a Boolean value, um, I'm going to cancel it because usually Cytoscape is good at guessing this. If it's ever not good at guessing it, you can always select there. Um, sometimes you can have your, uh, the columns um, uh, have a heading like you would often have in, in a spreadsheet. And then if you have a heading in your, in your file, you can click the show text file import options and you can say transfer the first line as attribute names. Um, and if I, I don't have headings here, but if I did, then those would jump up into this, well, you can see how they would work. They would jump up into this, into these headings. This doesn't make sense in this case, so I'm going to turn it off. If you have other data at the top of your file, you can start the import at a, a, for a row further down. And, um, and then you can, uh, there's certain other options here that you can, you can select. Um, so I'm going to just import this, and we'll see what happens. OK, so it, it worked, successfully loaded. Uh, 331 nodes and 362 edges. Okay, so now that I've loaded this data in, you can see that it's a hairball, right? So um, I have, I'm using these buttons here to uh, to zoom in and out. Um, if you have a, a, the right mouse, like three button mouse, or if you have a trackpad on, on the Mac, I'm just using the normal zoom in um, feature to zoom in and out. Um, and if you have a, a three-button mouse, you can use the middle mouse button to pan pan around. I think there's a control key here that um, yeah, so it's it's not working on this laptop. But the um, typically the three-button mouse, the middle mouse button will will you can press to to move around. Um, if you don't have that, you can always use this window to move move around the network. Okay, so this network is. Um, what you would see if you just loaded in a, um, a network of, of interest um, that you had already in a table format. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more about why you would use this table format versus something else. Um, and then the first thing that you would do is um, lay out the network in some way. So I talked about force-directed layouts. Um, one of my favorite force-directed layouts is called Y Files Organic. So that is, um, I like it the best, so I'm going to click that. and it, it lays out the network. Uh, so I'm going to now zoom in to, to the network. And as I zoom in, you might notice that um, the labels aren't showing here. But as I zoom in more, the labels show. So this is an optimization that Cytoscape uses that makes l looking at large, visualizing large networks um, faster. Um, it, basically, it doesn't show all the details when you've, when you've zoomed out. But there are some default options here that might not be useful, might not be um, uh, your preference of, of the option. So if, you are, um, if you're interested in always showing the detail, you can always go to View, Show Graphics Details. And often, and this is 
improved in Cytoscape 3, but that, that it's a similar idea. So you can show the graphics details, and now whenever you zoom in and out, it, the labels are always there. All the graphical details are, are, are going to be there. So that's um, sometimes confusing for people that they don't see the labels um, because they haven't zoomed in far enough. What, what are the, how does the It's a force-directed layout, so it's the same way that I mentioned. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, um, yeah. So it basically just says if you can tweak the parameters that. Yes, it it's a prettier. Yeah. So the or, the reason why I like organic is that exactly it, it it's a it's particularly good force-directed layout. It's not just tweaked parameters, but the people that made it have different heuristics that they use, like rules that they use to sort of figure out how to lay things out better. Uh, and um, the only issue with it is that it's commercial, uh, so it's the, it's not an open source product. And we've purchased a license to include it in Cytoscape, but it's um, it's it's uh, um, the, all the other layouts are are kind of. Um, reusable for other software and stuff. So probably doesn't impact most users, but uh, for any developer, that's one, one issue. Um, so um, yeah, the Y Files layouts, Y Files is a company, and they've done a pretty good job of making layouts. So their uh, hierarchical layout, for instance, is, um, is quite good. So here's a, if this was a tree, it would, uh, more of a tree structure, it would, it would look better. Um, let me just go back to an organic layout. Okay, but you can try the other layouts. The default layout is uh, the Cytoscape force-directed layout, and if you click, it's it's linked to this button here. So if you click it, um, it's it's pretty good as well. Um, so here's the the Cytoscape default one. So um, so yeah, you can you can see that these guys. There's some of the structure that I talked about in the network is visible after you lay this this network out. Um, okay, so um, I don't want. Yes? Um, how is column 6 that you imported, how is that used here? OK, I'll talk about, uh, I'll, that's a good question. Um, I can show you how those, those columns were, were imported and where they end up. So um, just before I do that, I just want to mention that the, OK, I'll, I'll go through this. Um, so the attributes that you load up in the network are not shown here by default. They're, they're present in here, and actually one of the annoyances of Cytoscape 2 series is that this uh, data panel, sorry, it's cut off here to change this. Um, these panels here can be turned on and off by um, this view menu, so I'm going to hide this results panel because it's taking up a lot of screen real estate. So um, this data panel here is where attributes are visualized. One of the confusing parts when using Cytoscape initially is that there's nothing shown here. And really, it sh we should show the attributes that you've loaded. So that's, that's fixed in 3.0. Um, but you can uh, select different attributes that you've loaded up. Um, and um, usually, I just click this button, select all attributes. So um, only when you've selected nodes here um, can you see what's, what's in this, this attributes uh, panel. Um, so uh, another little bit of a confusing thing when you start using it is that there's multiple panels here, so you have to actually click these tabs here to see different, different ones. So I don't know if everyone can see this, but this is the node attribute browser. So I didn't load up any node attributes yet. Um, I only loaded up edge attributes. So if I click this and I click this button to select all the attributes, now the columns that I had in my spreadsheet are loaded up here. So this is the interaction column, interaction type column, and this is column six. So, um, so I can, unfortunately, this column six is all one number, so it's not going to really um, change things. So I'll show you, I'll, I'll load up a, a better example with a lot more data to show you how visualization works with this data. Um, so I just, basically, column six is like expression It values, could be expression values, yeah, values. exactly, yeah, yeah. So because it's associated with the edge in this case, it would probably, a, a value like this might be confidence or strength of the connection. If it was associated with nodes, then it would be gene expression data, for instance. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I just want to quickly, you guys probably saw that you can select nodes and you can move them around. Um, I don't know if you saw this uh, um, way of um, aligning and distributing nodes, like uh, you, can, you can rotate nodes, um, which is fun, and, uh, but so sometimes useful if you're making, um, so there's certain things that you can do with these align and distribute that 
uh, that help you with publication quality images. If you're doing manual layout and you want to align a whole bunch of nodes in a line, you can just go here and say, um, okay, I want to uh, have these all lined up like this and distributed um, uh, like that. So they're kind of distributed. So this didn't work out that well because there's too many nodes, but now they're all evenly distributed and, and lined up. So that's sometimes useful for, um, for uh, manual layout. I'm going to turn those off. Um, oops. Okay. So the, the panels, um, you can also uh, click these buttons here to f move the panel somewhere else. If you have multiple computer monitors, sometimes that's useful. Um, let's see what else. Quickly, uh, selecting a set of nodes, you can um, create a new network based on this, these nodes, from se selected nodes all edges. So here's a network that I cut out of the other network. And now if I lay this network out, um, I, I can see uh, just the nodes that I've, that I've selected. So this is a useful way of focusing in your analysis to um, just nodes that, that you, uh, nodes of interest. So. Um, okay, so, um, and then this, this uh, network that I created is, is a sort of a child of this, this network here, and I can go back and forth using this thing. And there's these windows here also um, uh, available to kind of move around. So, um, okay, so I wanted to cover a few more things. One is uh, filtering, and the other one is visualization. Um, I'm going to load up a, another Cytoscape, a predefined Cytoscape session file that already has a lot of information loaded. What's the schedule, Michelle? Uh, we work at 10 15. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. So before I do, um, I just wanted to mention that um, while I imported network information here from a spreadsheet, uh, that's most useful for people that are generating their own network information. So not many people here are doing that. Uh, well, some people are, I guess. If you're doing, if you're generating any data that creates interactions, like protein interaction mapping or chip seek data, where you have multiple chip seek experiments that you've run and you have a transcription factor and all its all of the genes that it binds close to, um, those represent relationships. You might have that in a, in, a, in a table. Then you would definitely load them up by um, loading in a, a network from a table. Um, if you are starting with a gene list and you don't, your experiment doesn't include generating interactions in any way, then usually you wouldn't load the network in from a table because um, it's difficult to kind of get network information from lots of databases and combine them in tables. It's much easier to use a plugin like ReactomFI or Gene Mania, as you'll see this afternoon, to provide a gene list and then uh, convert it to a network um, by just querying a database. So that's another confusing thing that um, depends on where you're coming from, uh, what you, what part of Cytoscape you use. Hopefully that's clear now. Yeah. yeah that's sort of what I'm wondering about. So if you start with a gene list to use ReactOMFI yeah. to build the network, can you export that network in, as a table so then you can add values that are associated with your genes from your original list? You don't need to export it. You can just import a new table uh, sorry you want to you want sorry you want to add value add gene expression yeah so my gene list is gene expression yeah right? and I want to tie the whole change to all those nodes after I've gone and added the attributes through reactive five right yeah so you don't need to export the table ever you can do every uh, you can do everything you want within Cytoscape and that's a good question because that sort of shows this um, loading attributes. So I've loaded a network from a table. If you have attribute data like gene expression data and the and one of the columns is the genes and this the gene name for instance and the gene name is also used as the nodes here um, and then you have gene expression data then you can load it in with attributes from table. And let me do that right now. Um, one of the sample um, so this, this is uh, also sometimes confusing for people. The import attributes from network and import attributes sorry import network from table and import attribute from table have very similar um, screens here. So um, sometimes people get them confused. But I'm going to in import node attributes. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through here and um, find one here that is 
a node attribute table. Um, I'm, I'm opening it up. This, this table has a whole bunch of information um, here about these nodes, um, although here it's mostly gene ontology information. So let me see if I can find um, an example where it's um, gene expression data. Um, I think this is it. No. So, so this, this, um, these files that I'm loading up, if they don't, if they're not tab delimited, they they won't get parsed properly here. So, actually, one of the things I can do is I can, um, I can change. I can go to show text file import options, and I can say instead of a tab, use a space, and now these things get parsed correctly. So, um, parsing is just a computer science term that means pulling data out of a regular. Uh, regularly um, defined file. So, um, so now I have uh, my gene name and um, and some gene expression data. This file has uh, headings, so I'm going to um, import the first line as attribute name. So now these jump up here, and now I can pretty much import and. Um, oops, I need to. Okay, I think that, that by default it just it just defines the first uh, column to be the uh, identifier that you're using, um, but you can also um, choose another column here as your identifier column, so that if you have a spreadsheet with different different columns like Entree Gene IDs and Hugo Gene Names, um, and your network is Entree Gene IDs or Hugo Gene Names, then you can you can match you can match it up. Um, okay, so let's see what I did wrong here. Um, oh, duplicate attribute name, yeah. So these attributes, the, there's two um, attributes that are here. One is the gene expression value and the other one is the p-value and they just happen to be named the same. So I'm going to turn these guys off and import. Okay, so it loaded up all the data and now when I select some nodes um, and I go to the node attribute browser um, and I click select all attributes, now I see all these these attributes and here's my gene expression data. So that's that's how you would do it for your question, answer your question. Um, so now I can I can quickly show you, um, I, I, I think I'll stop soon, but I'll just show you a couple more things. Um, is it okay if I take a few more minutes? Okay. Um, okay, so one of the, uh, there's two things I want to show you. One is filtering and the other one is um, uh, visualization. So. Uh, this button here, and also one of the panels in the, one of the tabs in this panel here, filters, um, helps you define um, sections of the network that you want to select based on. It's basically querying the network. So um, I won't go over this too much because it's in the tutorial. But um, filters are uh, you can create all sorts of filters that say I want to select nodes that have gene expression higher than this, or gene uh, or uh, gene ontology terms equal to that. And um, or or the nodes are, that are named this, and you can create Boolean kind of uh, combinations of filters. Just one thing I want to point out, which is an interesting tip, is this this search field here. Um, by default, it searches um, it searches uh, for one column in the in the in the attributes, the node name, and I can press enter. I, I type in something, and I press enter, and it kind of zooms into that region that I've selected. But if you click this configure search options box here. You can set it to search any kind of data that you've loaded up. So I'm going to select um, gene expression data that I've loaded up to, to search, and I'm going to apply. And now this changes into a slider, a, a range slider. So now I can um, I can select uh, nodes. I'm going to zoom out here so you can see it. I'm selecting nodes based on gene expression. So I want to select all the, the nodes that are highly expressed. I can just um, select them here. And um, there's only a few that are lighting up. Um, I can click this button to kind of zoom into the set that's lit up, but because they're all over the place, it's it's um, um, it doesn't zoom in that much. But you can sort of see that um, as I move this, it, it it selects more. So this would be a way for me to select all the overexpressed gene nodes genes and then move that to a new network and focus in on them. Um, and you can do similar things with this filters box. It's just more complicated, and there's a tutorial that you can you can follow.
Um, okay, so uh, the last thing I want to show you is the visualization. So um, we go to this VizMapper tab, and this is also mostly covered in the tutorial, but just quickly. Um, you can um, take data from this, from the, from, sorry, from the attributes that you've loaded up here and map it to colors or shapes <coughs> or, or anything. So I'm going to take this column here of gene expression data and I'm going to map it to a color. So um, I have to find uh, the attribute that I like here, which is a little bit of a annoying, a little bit annoying because there's a whole bunch here. So we're actually currently, my lab is currently working on redesigning this. Um, so I'm sensitive to these issues. But the, um, the uh, so I can, I, can I, I found node color and I double clicked on it. So it says double click to create a mapping. Um, and, then I, and then it gives you a few options. So by default it says ID is the, um, this column here is what I want to map to. Um, but I actually want to map gene expression data to node color. So I, I'm going to click on this guy here. Um, and then there's different types of mapping. So continuous, pass-through, or discrete. Again, these are in, go, in detail in the tutorial. Um, pass, uh, the, the, the one that we want to use here is continuous. That's where you have some continuous value data that you want to map to a continuous uh, visual attribute. Um, so um, as soon as I do that, it sort of creates a default, um, a default color gradient here that goes from the smallest number to the biggest number. So in this case, um, the genes are automatically mapped to a grayscale based on their gene expression data where white is high overexpression and black is low underexpression uh, compared to control. But I can click on this and I can change these colors. Um, so I can change this color to um, red and now it's a different type of great uh, scale. I can also add additional points here so I can create something that's you know at zero it, it's it's white and then at um, high values it's um, and I can double click on these things to change the color here it's green or something like that so as I do that it usually usually updates itself automatically um, so I'm going to press OK occasionally this system gets into a state where this isn't updating automatically I find that um, it's just because the some button hasn't been pressed here in the right order that occasionally happens. Um, and so sometimes you just have to reset this to get it working again. And sometimes uh, a workaround is to hide the graphics details or toggle this graphic details like hide and show and then everything gets reset in the visualization system. So um, the, um, yeah, so that's, that's the basics of visualization. There's lots of different options here that you can try out. Um, uh, the plugins menu allows you to load in plugins, which you, you've already seen uh, before the, the workshop, hopefully, to load up your React MFI plugin. Um, and um, I think that's, that's it. Okay, any questions? Yep. Okay, so um, during the break, uh, a couple of people asked questions, so I'll just review some of those. So one question is, can you undo inside Escape? And yes, there is an edit undo. Function. It doesn't always undo every action, but most of the actions, like moving nodes and laying things out, uh, are undoable. Um, some of the plugins that you run aren't. The, the the people who program the plugins didn't implement an undo function, so it's not it's not undoable. So you can just check if what you're doing is undoable. Otherwise, you can just always save um, your session. Um, people also asked about. Um, uh, Cytoscape Web, if you are, uh, I guess if you are um, programming a website and you want to visualize a network on the website, there's a Cytoscape Web system that helps you do that. It's not a tool like Cytoscape that runs on the web, it's just a programming library, but it's, uh, it's, it's useful for, for some people. Um, okay, uh, other questions are more specific, so I'll, I'll um, if other people have them, we can, we can repeat them. Uh, Okay, so I talked about, I just gave you kind of a quick summary of Cytoscape, and there's um, uh, some tips ab about features that, that I think are useful. Um, this is the workflow, the sort of typical workflow that you would follow for, for network analysis. Um, so if you have your gene list, you, um, 
So as I mentioned, if you already have a network, you can start with the network and load it up into Cytoscape. If you don't have a network and you have gene lists and gene attributes like gene expression data, you need to load that into Cytoscape and you need to convert it to a network. And so these are tools here that help you convert um, convert your gene list into a into a network. Uh, and what's missing one is missing is Reactomify. It's actually mentioned down here, but um, the, then once you have your data in, in Cytoscape, yep? Can you just distinguish maybe which tools you need to do So, um, Gene Mania supports, so if you have non-human data, ReactomFI is only human. Gene Mania supports seven <coughs> model organisms, and uh, a couple of additional ones are coming online. Quaid will mention them probably this afternoon. Um, so it has human, mouse, rat, uh, yeast, C. elegans, Drosophila, Arabidopsis, and it's going to have E. coli soon, and zebrafish, and possibly this year Tetrahymena. So those are the ones that are um, that that are supported. Um, the um, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of other ones. The, another one is String. It doesn't. It's not as user friendly as Gene Mania. But String, and, and I'm sure Quaid will mention it this afternoon, String is a website that is similar to Gene Mania, uh, has a lot of similarities, and it supports um, all sequenced organisms, basically. So all organisms that have a gene, genome sequence. Um, Quaid will probably tell you the differences between them. Gene Mania plugin for Cytoscape is a lot better than the String plugin for Cytoscape. So that's why we're one of the reasons we're focusing on Gene Mania. Um, so uh, any other questions? Okay, so um, yeah, so these so this, these systems help convert a gene a gene list into a network. Uh, then you might have different types of networks, um, and you want to visualize them. Cytoscape itself handles all of the visualization that you need. You don't need to download any plugins. And then um, and then you can do different types of analysis, like we did pathway enrichment analysis. In Cytoscape, there's a plugin called Bingo that helps you do that. Otherwise, you do it on the web, like talked about yesterday. Um, uh, gene function prediction, we'll talk about this afternoon with Gene Mania and String. Uh, module detection, um, Reactum FI has some built in. There's also active modules and cluster maker. So these are not, we're not really discussing these, but what we've done, what I've done is I've um, put in some slides for these other plugins in the, in the presentation. And during the lab, you can go and look at them if they're interesting to you. So, um, and there's also some, um, if, you're, if you have a regulatory network, one of the things that people like to do with regulatory networks is look for motifs like feedback loops or um, feed forward loops or things like that. And so if you take the, a network that's generated from, from the tools that Wyeth uh, mentioned, um, there's a tool in Cytoscape called NetMatch, which helps you kind of identify these little motifs. Okay, so, um, the next few slides, I'm not really going to go over uh, very, very in detail. They're, as I mentioned, there to uh, give you a intro, a quick intro to our uh, to some of the other plugins that we found are useful, um, but not generally useful for everybody enough to to cover it in the in a course with the time that we have. So. Um, Vista Clara, for instance, helps you visualize lots of different gene expression data at the same time. And you can play a movie. Um, uh, so for, for Cytoscape, you can um, uh, follow this. So each one of these slides basically has an intro of the tool and then like a, a lab that you can follow if you're interested. So during the lab time, if one of these tools is interesting for you, you can, should be able to find a little lab here and follow it. So Bingo, that does enrichment analysis. Um, you get a visualization that looks like this of the gene ontology, um, and the nodes are colored. The gene ontology terms are colored by how enriched they are, so that's sometimes um, interesting visualization. Um, Cerebral is a little bit outdated, but it's it's a interesting tool for visualizing different conditions and time points of gene expression uh, data on a network. So it shows you different plots. Um, Active subnetworks is a tool for finding regions in the network that are connected and significantly differentially expressed across multiple conditions. So it's, it's trying to find, given uh, a network that you have, plus 
some gene expression data across multiple conditions, you find a region that's sort of active all over across all those conditions or across some subset of conditions. Um, network clustering, there's a, uh, a tool called MCODE that um, can find clusters in a, in a network. Um, and there's also Cluster Maker, which is mentioned on the um, flow chart that I showed you. Um, if you don't have any network information available from Gene Mania or Reactome, you're working on an organism, for instance, that isn't even completely sequenced, um, but you know that there might be some literature information. Uh, so, so one way you can you can access that information is by converting from a nearby converting network information available for a nearby organism by via orthology. Um, another way is to automatically try to extract information from the literature. Um, and this, this Agilent um, literature tool, um, there's a tool, a plugin called Ag Agilent Literature Search, which allows you to type in a set of genes. And you could also type in an additional keyword, like here is atherosclerosis or a specific type of cancer or context. And then it does a PubMed search to find abstracts that mention those genes. And then it looks for relationships described in the abstract. So it, you might find a sentence that says gene A binds to gene B or gene A regulates gene B. It will extract that information and draw a network for you. And then you can, you can actually look at the sentences that it used um, by right-clicking on the, the interactions and seeing the sentences that were used to create that interaction. And you can curate it by saying, oh, I, didn't trust, I don't trust that sentence. I'm going to delete, delete it. So. Um, uh, okay, network uh, motifs I mentioned, um, so that's, I'm just going to skip over that. Um, this is just a little lab that shows you how that works. And, um, and then the last slides in this section are Cytoscape 2.8 tips and tricks, which again I won't go over, but you can read through. Uh, if you're using Cytoscape 2.8 a lot, there are um, uh, a few different problems that sometimes people have that I've tried to mention already a couple of things, but um, you might find some uh, interesting knowledge here. It's probably more useful if you're definitely using Cytoscape often. Okay, so I'm gonna switch to another presentation to um, introduce the lab. Um, okay, so we have like an hour and a half uh, for lab time and um, I'm trying to, I'm going to go through this this lab fairly quickly uh, and then you guys can try it out. So this is a, a new, uh, focusing on um, a particular plugin that is useful in Cytoscape for helping to visualize and interpret the results of your pathway enrichment analysis that you did yesterday. Um, so we learned yesterday that a uh, enrichment test is very useful, um, and how we learned how it works. Uh, and this is an excellent idea. T more than 10,000 papers have used this this method to help interpret their data. And as you saw yesterday, you get this big table of uh, pathways and how enriched they are. Um, and um, one of the issues with with this looking at the data like this, is that there, um, there's actually relationships between these pathways. So for instance, a bunch of these pathways, B cell mediated immunity and myeloid cell differentiation, are, you know, they're related to immune, so the immune system. Um, they don't always say immune system, but if you know enough about biology, you can recognize a lot of different relationships here. And so it's actually this presenting data in this table is not a great way of presenting it because there's a lot of overlapping pathways and a lot of pathway crosstalk, a lot of genes that are part of more than one pathway. And it's the, this information about a specific theme like immune system is just spread out all over this the place here. So if we have a table where there's relationships between parts of the table, what's a good way of visualizing it? What's a good way of visualizing relationships? In the table. A network, exactly. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so this is what this enrichment map plugin does. It visualizes that table as a network. 
and the um, this is software that my lab has developed, a method that my lab developed. That um, there's actually a couple of methods out there like this. Um, uh, another one is called Clugo, which has a, a Cytoscape plugin available, which is pretty good um, as well. So uh, the idea here is that you um, instead of visualizing uh, all the gene sets as a big table uh, or the pathways, you can visualize them as nodes and you can see how they relate to each other because they, they, they might uh, be related because they share genes, like the uh, two pathways have a lot of genes in common. Okay, so in this uh, presentation, the enrichment analysis technique that I'm using to show the examples is gene set enrichment analysis, or GSEA. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, you have, this is where you, you can input a ranked gene list, and there's no threshold that you need to set. And then the, the important thing with GSEA is that it finds pathways that are up-regulated or enriched in the up-regulated set and enriched in the down-regulated set. So these are pathways that are going up and pathways that are going down. And um, the enrichment map uh, takes uh, the table of p-values and your pathways and their p enrichment p-values and visualizes it as a network like this. So we have each node is not representing a protein or a gene in this case. It's representing a whole set of genes or a pathway. So, uh, and then the edges are connecting pathways that have enough have a certain number of genes in common and using this overlap, typically this overlap score. So if these are the genes in pathway A and these are the genes in pathway B and they have a certain number of genes in common according to this simple score, then that gets translated to an edge width. Um, and so the, the thicker the edge width, the more genes are in common between these, these, these pathways. And then the enrichment color, is, sorry, the intent, the, the, whether in GSEA, uh, because it gives you up and down, um, that's mapped to red and blue, so up red is up and down is blue. And then the intensity of the color here is proportional to the significance. So more significant uh, path enrich more significantly enriched pathways are um, colored darker colors. Okay, so I'm just going to give an exa a example. There are three different ways that enrichment map is useful. Um, one is to visualize the results of a single enrichment like you did yesterday. Uh, so this is an example where we took some gene expression data from this paper where they were looking at uh, breast cancer cells and their response to estrogen. So they treated the cells with estrogen, they collected three samples, did gene expression data, uh, collected gene expression data on those, those samples and did the same thing for controls that were untreated. Uh, and then we compared these uh, to find differentially expressed genes and then ran an enrichment analysis, GSEA, and we got this big table, and then um, the visualized this as, as an enrichment map. So the enrichment map, enrichment map Cytoscape plugin was used to uh, draw this picture automatically. So um, actually what enrichment map does is it draws all the nodes and the edges and does all the coloring. It doesn't do these bubbles here. Um, the bubbles and the labels are currently added manually afterwards for publication quality images. Uh, we're working on a future version that can try to draw these bubbles automatically. It's not always easy, but um, the, uh, so what you can see immediately here is that instead of seeing hundreds of pathways, we can see many fewer themes because a lot of these, each node is a pathway and a lot of nodes are kind of related to each other. So um, all of these nodes, all these pathways are somehow related to RNA transport and that is now more visible as a general functional theme rather than having these pathways spread out all, all over the table. So immediately we can get, this, so what this really does is gives you a, a very quick visual summary of your gene expression data in this case in terms of pathways. Um, again, we're always using gene expression data as an example, but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be gene expression data. Um, the adva one advantage of enrichment map is that it can be used for any type of enrichment test that, you've, that you have. So if you have GWAS data and, or if you have methylation data, you can, and you, you've done your pathway analysis, you can load the results into enrichment map. Okay, so zooming in on one of these clusters here, you can see the actual gene ontology terms that are, um, that are associated with each node. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, another thing, the second use of enrichment map uh, is comparison of two enrichments. So this is something that's actually not possible in any other tool that I know of. Um, in this um, case, the 
uh, the paper that we looked at, they actually had multiple time points, and they were interested in seeing the difference, things that were differentially expressed between the early time point, an early time point and a late time point in this estrogen treatment uh, experiment. Um, we used the gene, the you know, gene ontology as our gene set database, and we created um, uh, an, an enrichment analysis. Pa we did pathway enrichment analysis on this time point and this time point. So we had two pathway enrichment analyses, and then we loaded them up as an uh, as a enrichment map where the first, the early time point enrichment uh, is mapped as the center of the node and the late time point is mapped as the border of the node. So here's, here's a node that has um, a, a bright red border and a white center. So white means that there was no enrichment at the early time point in this pathway, um, but the red border means that at the late time point, this pathway is really enriched and, 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 uh, and upregulated. So, um, so if you're interested in looking at pathways that were differentially enriched between two different time points, uh, you, you might notice that a lot of the nodes are red, so that means that there's not really any difference between the two time points. Here's a section where uh, there's a bunch of nodes that have bright red centers and white borders. So bright red center means uh, enriched at the early time point, and that white border means not enriched at the late time point. And here's a section, ubiquitin-dependent protein degradation, where the reverse picture is seen. And, um, and so, the, you know, there seems to be a lot of change happening here, but the rest of the map it's not that much change. So this visualization method makes it really easy to see this pattern if you were looking at tables and just you'd have to match up all the tables together and take quite a long time as I'm sure you can imagine. So this is again just an example of how network visualization could be useful to quickly see patterns in, in data. So zooming in on this, uh, this little section here, if you have gene expression data and other types of genomics data could be loaded up in similar ways just with the appropriate formatting, the enrichment map tool allows you to click on a uh, pathway and see the genes in that pathway and a specific heat map for that pathway. So I clicked on this node here and I got this gene map, gene expression map, and you can see that, wow, there's a really big difference between 24 hours treated and untreated, um, and at the early time point, treated and untreated doesn't have a very big difference. So that's why this node has a bright red border and a white center, because the, it's not, this pathway is not differentially, it's not really enriched um, at the early time point and it's enriched at the, in differentially expressed genes at the late time point. This is the reverse picture here. Um, you might notice that uh, these patterns are a little bit, you know, the, the big difference here is that you're looking for difference between experiment versus control. The way that that difference works, whether it's um, all, um, uh, up, so green is up and purple is down, whether the genes are all up or the genes are all down um, is not really visible from this enrichment analysis. You just see um, that there's no change here and no change here. Any, any questions? Okay, so the third and last use case uh, use of enrichment map is what we call query set analysis. So there's a, a number of different things, a number of different biological questions that this can help answer. But the idea is that you've done your pathway enrichment analysis, you've visualized your results as an en enrichment map. In this case, we took gene expression data from a, a, a mouse heart tissue that was published in this paper. Um, and these, 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 research, these investigators had knocked out a microRNA, which, um, as most of you probably know, is a negative regulator of gene expression. So if you knock out a microRNA, you expect the targets of that microRNA to now be generally upregulated because the, the negative regulator has been removed. So um, we found that uh, you know, there's a, a lot of pathways that were upregulated and some pathways that are, were downregulated. So now we wanted to know how, does this, how do the pathways that were up, up and down regulated, how do they relate to the microRNA targets that we know that are, pre uh, that are predicted in a microRNA target prediction database? Um, we used target scan, I think, for this one. Um, so we had a set of microRNA predicted targets, and that def that's another gene set. So just like all these pathways are gene sets, the predicted targets of a microRNA are gene sets. And um, we represented that gene set as another, um, in this query set, uh, sort of, a, we queried this, this enrichment map with this additional set. We said, okay, how 
much overlap is there between this set and all these pathways. And these additional lines that are drawn in the inertial map show the overlap between the targets and the genes and the pathways. So certain pathways, like this vesicle trafficking pathway, have a lot of microRNA targets, so they get thick lines. And other pathways that are going up, like uh, translation, um, don't have any microRNA targets in common. And the pathways that are going down don't have any microRNA targets in common. So that makes sense. So the, the targets are kind of focused in pathways that are going up, which makes biological sense. Um, but not all the pathways are linked targets, so we might see, we might in interpret that from this, that uh, we might infer from this that uh, certain pathways are directly regulated by this microRNA and other ones are not, because they don't have the targets. So that's a way that you can use, um, you can ask another, the, the, so the, the biological question that we asked here is, given the pattern of gene, of pathways that are going up and down, um, and the, the fact that we've perturbed this microRNA in our experiment, uh, how can we explain the effect of this microRNA in terms of physical connections between you know, the, the microRNA and its targets um, by using this additional, additional information? Yes? Yes. Yes. So you can use this for transcription factors as well. So um, taking what you learned about transcription factors, you could do a similar analysis. And you can actually, one of the things that we want to do, implement as an automatic search system, but we haven't done it yet, is uh, search a whole bunch of transcription factors and see which ones ex best explain the results. And that would help tell you which transcription factor might be uh, regulating your gene of interest. Um, so right now, we don't have that automatic search system, so you could manually take some transcription factors that you might know are, are interesting. Maybe they're, 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 you know something about your system that tells you gives you a hint about a transcription factor. Um, or you use the, uh, the tools that Wyeth mentioned uh, on Monday to identify, to do that search automatically. And then you can put that, um, take those transcription factor targets and put them in here and see how they, they explain the pathways. So we've done that a few times. Actually, it's, it's worked out quite well with certain projects that we have. OK, so the, the autism spectrum disorder map that I showed you on the in the introduction on the morning of, uh, on Monday morning, actually used this enrichment map idea and uh, used all these features. So it's, it, um, the, the, the circles here are pathways that were enriched in the copy number mutations, um, if you remember the, 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 the study. Um, we also had additional sets of genes that we knew were important. So there were genes that were known to be associated with autism spectrum disorder and genes that were known to be involved in in intellectual disability. So we added those as a query as query sets. Um, we also did enrichment pathway enrichment analysis on those gene sets because they were some of them were quite large. I think there were about 200 genes in here or so. And um, and so all of these triangles are pathways that represent pathways that were, were enriched in these genes. Um, these uh, parallelograms were um, pathways that were enriched in autism genes, and then we can see how they were overlapping each other. So this is a bit complicated, a bit of a complicated enrichment map, but it um, uses all the, the features that I, that I mentioned. Okay, so um, the gene set source, sources that were used in the autism spectrum disorder case were gene ontology, pathway databases like Reactome, and PFAM domains for your information. So this is the enrichment map plugin in Cytoscape. Um, you uh, have a, this is where you enter your data. Uh, once you generate your enrichment map, it's displayed here, and you can click on nodes to see the heat maps. Um, if you're using gene set enrichment analysis, you might know that there's a feature called the leading edge, um, which helps define, which basically identifies the genes that are providing the strongest signal to the enrichment, or for the enrichment. And those are highlighted here if you load data from, G from GSEA. And then um, you can interactively change the p-value and q-value cutoffs, and this will update automatically. So this is also a good way of exploring your pathway enrichment analysis um, because you can, you can change those, those, those things interactively. So I mentioned that enrichment map is a, gives you a very nice visual summary of your pathway enrichment results. Um, what we'd like to do, and that's sort of, that's, that's great. Um, usually what people, what you do when you are looking at that uh, is the way that you would, you would use that 
map is you would use it to quickly identify functional themes that look interesting to you based on your, your knowledge of the system. Um, you might see things that are well known and so you're, they're not interesting. You might see things that you didn't know about but look like they're linked to the phenotype that you're studying and so those might be interesting. And you might see a bunch of stuff that you have no idea how it's linked to the phenotype and so maybe that's potentially really interesting but you, you, it doesn't have a link so it's, you're not going to follow up on it. So that's normally the way people think when they're looking at these enrichment results. So once you've identified something interesting, you'd like to zoom in on it and look at the genes, look at the gene expression. Um, so for instance, we find that um, in this map, there's a region that looks very like it's, it's changing a lot um, and it incorporates a lot of gene sets that are pathways information that comes from reactome and one of the pathways is reactome apoptosis. So then um, what you'd like to do is download the pathway, the, re the apoptosis pathway from reactome and overlay your gene expression data on the, uh, the pathway. And so we've changed from a network where the nodes represent pathways to a network that is a pathway where the nodes represent proteins. And, um, and we have overlaid gene expression data on here. And then, um, and then you can zoom in. You might find that one region of this pathway is actually the, where you know all the signal is, all the differential expression signal is coming from one region. So zooming into this level to get a more f detailed mechanistic understanding of um, of the gene, you know, the genes in your gene list uh, is you know kind of a path that most people would want to take. And we're we're currently working on making this easier. You can do all of this in Cytoscape manually, but um, we'd like to have it more point and click in the future. Um, I mentioned that one thing that Enrichment Map uh, doesn't do right now is automatically circle the uh, regions here and uh, the what I call functional themes. It doesn't automatically circle them and label them. Uh, so we've developed a, a, another plugin called WordCloud where you can select a set of nodes and you, um, if these are all gene ontology terms, for instance, uh, the word cloud will show you the most frequent terms using this word cloud visualization, which you might have seen on, on, on the web. A lot of times this is used as tag clouds. So the more often, the more frequent a, a, a word appears in the gene ontology terms, the bigger it's uh, shown here. And so this is a signaling related cluster and there's different signaling uh, pathways in here. So this is sometimes useful for navigating an, an enrichment map. Okay, so um, the um, that's basically it. Just uh, Ruth, uh, just to um, acknowledge uh, Daniela Marico, who uh, came up with this original idea, and Ruth Isserlin is a person, uh, a research assistant in my lab, who developed this this plugin. And one of the things that she uh, she she really liked developing this plugin because she's using it a lot for her uh, her own analysis. And so she she. Um, was excited enough about it that she, when she was presenting at a lab meeting, she baked uh, an enrichment map cookie, and uh, and then um, so I can tell you that and this was really good. So I can tell you enrichment maps are useful and also tasty, um, <laughs> if you ever eat one. Um, okay, so the um, so we're we're moving to the lab now. Uh, the so the next hour and a bit is um, I guess we're we finishing at twelve fifteen or twelve thirty. 15. Okay, so the next hour or so um, is the lab, and I'm 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 not going to do a demo. I'm just going to let you guys try and um, and follow the the the, the lab. Um, the I in this lab you can do a few things. So the main idea, the main activity in the lab we are I'm proposing is uh, try out enrichment map. So you need to follow these steps. Um, you need to download the, you, if you haven't already done it, you need to load the enrichment map plugin from the plugin manager in Cytoscape. So this is, this is a Cytoscape plugin. So you load Cytoscape, install the enrichment map plugin, and then you can load in your results from David or GProfiler, um, the results that you, you had yesterday. Um, but there's also a bunch of tutorials that we've made available on the enrichment map website, and Michelle has printed them out for you. So you can, you can follow them. Um, so there's, there's, there's a number of different paths that you can take. The default path is to um, uh, take the, the, the data that you did from yesterday's lab that you created in yesterday's lab and load it into Enrichment Map. So um, you can take the David results 
Uh, if you don't have them, you can re recreate them and, um, and, and save them and then uh, um, load them up into Enricher Map. Um, or you could follow one of the tutorials. The good thing about the tutorials is that they have data that is available for download where everything, all the data that you need is right there, including gene expression data, and you can just follow the tutorial to load, them up, load the data up. Um, you can also, uh, Veronique uh, very uh, recently um, added a, um, a tutorial that shows you how to take the liver data that you had in the integrated assignment and, um, and load that data up as an emission map. And then finally, you can try your own data. Um, and then the other thing you can do in the lab is just try out Cytoscape, try out some of the different plugins, like the slides that I presented earlier, um, or ask questions about uh, your data that you have and what kind of analyses um, I could recommend for, for that. OK, so next hour, just try, try out those things. And uh, if you have any questions, put up your hand.